Arch Gita. I'm excited to have Steph here. She's going to be talking about healthcare data. You know, we've been doing this, if you're new to this Gita group, we've been doing this for about six and a half years. The goal is to foster collaboration and learning around data science. And so we, we hear from a bunch of different perspectives uh, around research, academia, industry. And I think throughout the six and a half years, it's been interesting to see the trend of where applications have gone in here data science. Like we started with a lot of the big tech companies and um, just some research areas. And now we're seeing other industries. We've had some government talks. Um, and now healthcare, which is one of those, you'd say, late adopting industries. We're seeing that come to the forefront with use of data and analytics. And so I'm excited to hear what Stephanie has to say about her experience uh, in that world. Um, so a few things about Stephanie. She's an adjunct lecturer of the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois under the I think she's been here a couple years and she's enjoying herself, starting PhD work uh, in the fall. Uh, she's also an adjunct faculty at DePaul University in Chicago and a senior analyst at Brigham and Women's Hospital's Division of Cardiovascular Medicine in Boston, Massachusetts. She formerly worked at the University of Chicago for five years as a biostatistician of the Department of Medicine section of cardiology, where she assisted attendings, fellows, residents, and medical students with clinical research. So she has a nice combination of actually being in the field, working with real data for healthcare. She also worked in Chicago at Nielsen, a marketing research firm as a senior statistician, and navigating a consulting firm as a consultant in disputes and investigations where she assists with data breaches and litigation support. Uh, her research interests are in statistics, data analysis, and machine learning. A great fit for this group. Uh, she's completed a MS in predictive analytics, uh, computational methods, concentration, and image analysis specialization from DePaul University, as well as an MS in applied statistics and an MA in criminal justice and criminology from Loyola University of Chicago. She also has an MS in accountancy, a BSBA in accountancy, a BA in English with a manuals minor, and a BA in sociology, with a criminology concentration from John Carroll University. Uh, she's got all the degrees. She has all the degrees, yeah, I think she has them all. So it's exciting to see someone, I mean, you know, certainly data is touching across some different fields and even just uh, backgrounds, and it, it'll be exciting to hear what she has to say. So please join me in welcoming Stephanie. Thank you so much. And uh, it's actually quite ironic. So uh, today's talk is healthcare has hard, but we still haven't found what we were looking for in data science. So as much as we love data, we have to take it easy in our daily life or data will tear our hair out. Um, so as you can tell here, I have some innuendos in here, hard because I'm in cardiology research. Uh, Haven is the R package that we use to read in data. Um, and one of my favorite bands is U2, and obviously my other love is data science. Um, the other interesting part about today's talk is that today is March 3rd. It happens to be employee appreciation at Brigham. Um, and also March is great for a lot of statistics. You have uh, basketball, you have St. Patrick's Day, Pi Day, of course. Um, but we have a lot of appreciation to the healthcare workers in March as well. And so this talk is dedicated uh, to all of my co-workers and healthcare staff who made all this research possible. And really the integrated uh, nature of the research that it's not just a one person uh, type band. It's really all of us coming together from point A to point Z. Uh, to collect the data. Uh, so today's agenda is talking about data science in the sphere of cardiovascular research. So I'll use some of the research that I've had over the last several years in terms of how we've tried to incorporate data science. Um, and then I'll talk about future areas of, yet again, interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, but also how we can use advanced data science methods in real-time health uh, decisions. And then finally, for any of the students in the room uh, and on Zoom, uh, transferable skills uh, that can be helpful from school to the uh, workforce in healthcare data science positions. Um, or if you're that needs our person that's always like, what skills do we need for these healthcare positions? Uh, we'll traverse some of that at the end of today's talk. So the first, um, these are sort of like case studies in terms of what I've done uh, in research and each of them is a little more anecdote. So some notes, um, I'm not going to be talking about cardiovascular medicine and getting to the weeds of, of all the cardio terminology here. Um, I'll bring out where it's necessary for some of the uh, final outcomes. Um, but most of this is related to you know, using healthcare applications obviously to solve treatments, diagnosis, and uh, hopefully prevention of different cardiovascular issues, um, but also to talk more about from the data science perspective. So uh, the first story comes with, uh, we were looking to understand severe tricuspid regurgitation 
uh, in groups that actually have severe, but is there more than just severe, is there extreme severe, or we call it massive? And how do we go about defining this group and locating this group statistically? Um, and so I normally am a STATA user. I've also used SAS um, for biological research. Um, but not all programs have all the algorithms that we need. And so being flexible to go from uh, program to program is necessary. So one of, the, one of the programs that I needed was in uh, the R resource here, R caps. I uh, had an awesome package that you can do mul multiple way splits and not using ter tiles or uh, the standard practices that we normally use in biological research. Uh, the story for this is important because two is open resources are really becoming really popular these days. Uh, most of the mathematical methods are coming out in R for statistics than they are in STATA or SPSS or SAS. Um, and so that helps with that as well. Um, but the other side of the story is the limitations. Uh, R is updating quite frequently now post-COVID almost all the time. It used to be once a semester, once a quarter, and now it's like every week there's a new update. And what happens here is when you're using packages that are dependent upon other packages, if they're not updating in sync with each other, they're no longer working. And so one of the issues with this package was it was created by a wonderful group in South Korea, but they hadn't updated their package, and I really needed it to work. So I had to actually contact them in South Korea, and we're like 12, 15 hour time differences, but like, I really need to publish this article, and I need to use your algorithm to do it. So um, just the pluses and minuses of, of working uh, with open source programming. The next approach uh, study that we did here uh, is one in electrophysiology, where we are using novel approaches to mapping the heart, uh, essentially the electrical rhythm of the heart. Um, and this is for understanding uh, where the ventricular uh, rhythm is happening. And we also, from a cardiovascular standpoint, what's the appropriate part of the heart to go into to ablate, essentially uh, remove tissue to correct that heart rhythm. Um, and so this is the first time that we're able to actually map all of this out. Um, and be able to figure out where is the best way to target, where is the scar tissue, if we have multiple ablations and things of that nature. Um, but the main point of the data story message here is not everything that we do in healthcare is just the biostatistician to be um, analyzing all the data, but also that we have different opportunities in data. So these wonderful figures were created by a graphic designer. Uh, so the ideas and the handwritten drawings were developed by the physicians. Um, but to make it professional for publication purposes, um, these are all elaborately created uh, by a graphic designer. Uh, the other important aspect of this is how did we get the measurements uh, to be able to analyze statistically? Well, we had actually data people working uh, with commercial programs that were in the operating rooms, live in real time, helping to collect this data. And so uh, understanding their commercial programs and how to best collect these measurements in accurate real time for different uh, wide variety of healthcare situations uh, was very important here as well. In the next uh, case study here is one of three COVID-19 studies that we did at the University of Chicago Medical Center. Um, and in this regard, uh, this is more, yes, we're using basic uh, statistical, biostatistical methods, but understanding how to work under adaptability and uncertainty. So we were dealing with COVID, the studies in the first 30 days, um, how do we treat something we've never seen before? So um, we at this point didn't even know that it was similar to SARS-CoV-2 uh, that we had seen before. Uh, trying to figure out in the genetics department, which I wasn't a part of, but how can we calculate the strains of this fast-moving uh, pathogen? Uh, but in this study, how as physicians, how as physicians, could we better determine who's going to be at risk? And at this time, what we were noticing, even 30 days in, is that there were a select group of individuals that were going to be intensive care unit status. Um, and so what we were able to figure out with uh, high sensitivity troponin, uh, which is one of the things that we deal for heart failure conditions and, and understanding uh, different dynamics of the heart, um, was would these individuals also require more ICU, oxygen, intubation, um, and those types of things. So, um, not all research is, we've seen it before, we're using literature reviews that have been out there for years, 
um, but trying to use related news, try to do this in a fast and easy manner. And as difficult as it was for coming up with COVID vaccines that normally take 10 to 15 years to create, trying to create a medical database um, in a month to six months to get this out to people that need to use it in real world time. And it's not like we can wait a year for this to be cleaned and published and ready to go. We need answers. Um, an interesting fact that also came out, uh, the first study that we did in COVID-19 actually didn't get printed in a journal. It's actually a preprint. We tried to print it in a journal. Um, what ended up happening was our samples were too small compared to Columbia University and all the network of hospitals in like Boston and, and uh, New York City. Um, but ironically, we had an 80% population of African Americans at the University of Chicago Medical Center. Uh, and so it's quite important for diversity purposes to understand how COVID-19 was affecting that population. And so in that regard, uh, it's actually one of the highly cited preprints of COVID-19 uh, for that uh, one fact there. The third study that we did was actually a wave longitudinal study. So there were two peaks, high peaks in COVID-19. And so trying to understand uh, how COVID-19 affected from the first wave uh, to the second wave as well, which involved our cardiovascular imaging team uh, as well as our uh, general cardiology team. The other important thing that we get bogged down with statistics and machine learning is that there's a whole new world out there beyond computer vision and all those areas, and that's geospatial analysis. Uh, and normally we see a lot of this in the geography department, and this was actually uh, a study that involved epidemiology, so studying the overall population of our group and the community, um, but also uh, a geographer to help with geospatial regression as well as geospatial mapping, um, as you see here. The background of this story is, if you're familiar with the Chicago area, was 2014 was one of the most critical areas uh, where we had 500 plus murders and homicides um, in that year. And it was the largest that we've seen in like decades. Um, and so we wanted to understand how does this uh, help understand clinical people living in South Chicago to deal with this on a daily basis? Is there specific radii that affect um, their heart uh, health as well as their overall health? And we found this actually does have a fact on systolic blood pressure, which can you know, be affected by not only physiology, but stress and other environmental factors um, as well. Um, and obviously, not too surprising, uh, if you read the paper, it also affects like missing appointments for doctors, um, as well as um, cardiovascular mortality. The next uh, study is not one that I have done, but it was actually just came out of Pew Research. Uh, so it was conducted in December of 2022, but it was just actually put out last month. Um, in regards to how the general public feel about artificial intelligence um, in the healthcare spectrum. So in this regard, as you can see, um, 11,000 adults were surveyed in their understanding of how artificial intelligence is used in the healthcare uh, sphere. And as you can probably see from these small pie charts, which are not our favorite graphs, as we know for data people, we like bar charts. Um, but in this case, we can see that 60% of the general public is uncomfortable with artificial intelligence. Um, and for those that are comfortable, uh, only 38% of them feel that it's going to be helpful for health research. And so part of our question, um, and what I forgot to iterate at the beginning of my talk as well, is as we know as researchers, research questions drive everything that we do. And so part of our issue with data science is do phys physicians know what data methods can answer these more difficult uh, type of questions? Because if they're just used to their intro to biostatistics course they took 20 years ago, do they know that there are statistical data science, uh, computer science methods that are out there that can detail into more complex uh, questions that they may have not been able to answer previously or different programs or groups of people around campus that can help them answer uh, not necessarily the, the biostatistics uh, data department, but epidemiology and ge uh, geography and other spheres that way as well. But the other point from this uh, survey has mentioned is that we need to understand what the general public feels, how that's going to help shape their health, individual health care, um, as well as the overall public health as well. Um, as you can notice from some concerns here, uh, you know, loss of personal care, is everything going to be a robot, a tel telehealth medicine, a chat bot, um, you know, are we even going to have a physician touching us or trying to figure out 
uh, you know, qualitatively what's happening in terms of the pallor of our skin and things of that nature. Um, and as always, I, my first work job was in data incident data breach. The first question I always ask anybody, how are you using my data? Where is it stored? What happens when you're done with this survey? Where is this data going to be stored? How is it going to be destroyed? Um, you know, are you going to just try to wipe it once and that's it? You know, you know that's not how it really works, right? So in that regard, um, as well as the other issues of implementing tools too soon, uh, as you'll see from some of the models that I'm going to show here in the next few slides, um, we're still in the work in progress to find a, you know, a model in particularly social sciences and healthcare that's going to always be 90, 100% accurate. Uh, for everything, um, and so uh, we're always trying to uh, trying to improve those models, but know the generalizability and how well, in what situations we can actually use those models. So the next case story here is: uh, Can the hospital risk score be improved by the inclusion of social factors? And for any of you that are not familiar, the hospital risk score has uh, several different variables in it. Um, that is used to try to predict the 30-day hospital readmission rate. And in a healthcare setting, this is really important for several reasons. First of all, you get dinged if your patient gets readmitted back in 30 days. But ultimately, for the healthcare, um, someone who's getting readmitted quite frequently back into the hospital is quite sick. And so, are we taking care of this patient uh, in the appropriate manner so that they're not keeping returning to the hospital? Uh, and so, treating the, the main underlying condition and not just the symptoms uh, of the different various conditions. From a data science standpoint, this was really important. Uh, this is our bread and butter basic biostatistics. Um, on the right hand side here, you can see an ROC curve, and we ultimately found that the social factors are already incorporated into the hospital risk score. So our comorbidities and other types of variables like age and gender are already sort of establishing some of these risk factors um, as well. But we didn't know this statistically, so we had to run uh, the empirical evidence here. And as we know from any regression model that we've ever run, if we throw a bunch of X variables together, what happens? We have essentially multicollinearity of overfitting, right? And we can't throw all those variables in at once. So what ends up happening in here is how do we treat that? And the main way that we can easily treat this is through a principal component analysis or a factor analysis. And that's what we did here. We did a principal component analysis. And you might be going, well, why am I using this as a case study? We've been doing these for years. When I first started going for my master's degree in statistics, I actually had to get an override to go into a PhD psychology department to get multivariate statistics. And as you know from someone in applied science, what are the three most common types of multivariate statistics that we use it is principal component analysis, factor analysis, cluster analysis, and even things like regularized regressions. And so, fast forward, not dating myself, 15, 20 plus years, now we're teaching this at the undergraduate level as well as at the master's level, because if, you, if you're not going into a PhD, you're gonna need this information. Um, and actually, several of my jobs that I got at marketing at Nielsen was, can you do multivariate statistics, or someone's leaving, and you're the only one on the floor that knows how to do SAS, and do a, uh, a factorial uh, factor analysis uh, for our car industry uh, profit. So I'm not even in that sector, but you're inheriting it because you're the only one on the floor that can do it, right? So um, having these wide, broad skill sets that are adaptable across all different sorts of applications, um, even though at the time I was the brick and mortar person finding your next Starbucks location, so it's not across from another Starbucks. So. Um, understanding those different types of analyses. Um, this is a great example where when you have physicians that actually have an interest in data, um, Dr. Anwu, who is the uh, primary uh, physician on this paper, was actually a computer science major. He was in the workforce and software for a while and decided he wanted to go back into healthcare and get his um, MD. Um, and eventually he also went back for a master's degree in informatics um, as well. And so in this regard, um, both pretty much everyone on the team was a data person, but also had applications in various forms of healthcare. So what happens when you have a lot of data people with healthcare, you try to ask, answer all sorts of complicated, complicated questions. So this was one of the first uh, 
manuscripts that we did in, uh, in the cardiology department, we were actually using advanced machine learning uh, types of algorithms for more prediction, not a typical explanation uh, of what was happening. So in here, uh, we created a risk score called salad bar. Of course, we're also creative, so trying to come up with those catchy phrases. Uh, to understand hospital admission or emergency department presentation uh, in ambulatory patients, essentially the patients coming into the emergency department uh, with cardiovascular disease. Um, as you can see here, we used, um, we had you know, thousands or hundreds of different risk factors we can include. We can't include all of them. Uh, this was also the main objective that we wanted to create something in a dashboard, right? So you have a physician or a nurse that's looking at a dashboard next to the hospital bed we need to make decisions in quick minutes. We can't have 20 variables that we're inputting um, into this model in real time. So using logistic regression, we took the top uh, variables that um, had the highest um, uh, odds ratios, um, as well as looking at you know, other performance metrics uh, with them, um, Gini and so forth. Um, and then uh, used uh, machine learning models Actually, Boost being an ensemble model, very similar or kissing cousin to the decision trees, uh, that was performing better than the other ones that we were including. Um, but as you notice here, for anyone who's done machine learning, 24% is not a really great thing, right? So, as typical with healthcare models, they're very good at first at determining what people don't have, but the really good models are then trying to predict what they actually do have. So, can we predict that they actually? will have these events. Uh, and so while our accuracy is high, it's mostly because the true negatives are being accurately identified and not necessarily the true positives. So yet again, knowing from the Pew Research Survey, this, is, this model is only going to be useful to a certain extent, right? And so uh, still will require physician, healthcare, uh, uh, staff making decisions about uh, health, individual healthcare. Uh, this is an uh, area where we use machine learning and a lot of our advanced data science approaches quite frequently, and that is in cardiovascular imaging. Uh, so computer vision for you know, 20 decades, uh, for at least the last two decades or more, have been using computer vision, machine learning, um, and now that we have deep learning neural networks, I'm able to be doing it uh, more advanced now as well. Uh, ultimately, what we were doing in this study was trying to uh, segment out complex heart anatomy, not our typical left circle ventricle, um, but all sorts of different types of uh, parts of the heart, um, and then being able to uh, see how accurately that is to the ground truth. So uh, ground truth is manual ground truth. We're having to have a physician, phys uh, attending, or fellow circle all of these circles uh, using either programs uh, or manually with a stencil, um, and then be able to check how accurate that is to the automated uh, version here. That is something that we actually did uh, with commercial programming. So in this paper, we actually wanted to see uh, the top is, and sorry, apologies, it's hard to see, uh, the top is the clinician. Um, so we had a physician, her whole job was a grant, that was instructing her to do all the ground truth for all the studies that we have in this uh, manuscript. And then we compared it to the three commercial programs, and I'm sorry, I can't tell you which three they are, and I was blinded uh, when analyzing this data. Um, but we compared three common commercial programs out there for automated segmentation of this uh, computer vision area, and wanted to see how accurate uh, they were. And they ended up being closely to about 80 to 86 percent. Um, the left ventricle, which has for historical purposes always been slightly easier to segment out and to analyze, uh, was good, but there are still ways to improve it. And then the right ventricle, which tends to be smaller than the left and not you know, a nice circle or nice shape that we know how to segment easily, uh, always needs a little bit more refinement in terms of how we can perfect that. The next study that I have in here is one where it wasn't actually our own study. We at the University of Chicago Medical Center were a very small single center, and as you always know, the main limitation of that is sample size. So while one way to increase sample size outside of multi-center research, which you do for retrospective clinical trials, is if we're doing something, uh, excuse me, prospective for clinical trials, 
What is one thing that we can do retrospectively is look at large databases. So this study, we actually looked at the Tribune Health Market Scan database. Um, this is an insurance database that looks at uh, private and all different forms of insurance. The one limitation of this study is because it's anonymous to who is in each row, because you're getting this as an aggregate, is that if you went to job one and got your group health insurance, and then you lost your job and went on to COBRA until you found your next job, and then got your second health group insurance plan for your second company, you could be into this database multiple different times. Um, and so there's different limitations you have to consider when you're dealing uh, with national registry or particularly insurance claims data. Um, the other important thing here is you had to have an insurance claim. So if there was an insurance claim for the work provided by the healthcare provider, that also would not be in here as well. Um, and they also don't collect extensively with the healthcare that you get in an operating room as well. So it's more ICD codes and things that were used for billing uh, purposes that you would see on your billing statement from the hospital. Uh, the last thing uh, that I wanted to note with this as well is um, this registry collected mortality up until, I want to say 2015 or 2017. So then we got into the issue that we wanted to do this study up until 2019, 2018, and we only had mortality data until since 2016, 2017. Um, and so then the limitation is we can only have our research study be from this to this, uh, time point because we need the mortality outcome, our major outcome for uh, research studies. The other important thing about this uh, study as well was it was a retrospective study, but at the same time, two really important uh, RCTs, randomized control trials, came out at the same time. And so when this got published in JAP, uh, which is a tier one journal, it was then able to be connected with those, and the editors were really happy to see, you know, this is what we're seeing trending in the historical data. Can we connect the dots to the perspective, real-world application that we saw in those two clinical trials? And so they were able uh, to see that as well. And so now I'm at MassGen Brigham, and one of the lovely things about that is I'm in a network of 10-plus hospitals, so I don't have to worry about sample size. Um, which is a really nice thing. Um, this database actually precedes me coming in, but I now have the pleasure that our first abstract with this registry is going to be tomorrow at the American Car uh, College of Cardiology. Uh, so one of our lovely fellows um, will be presenting that. So I'm not going to be presenting any data off this registry, but I'm just going to explain it a little bit here um, as to the process. Because one of the late moving things in healthcare research um, is using natural language processing. 80% of data in healthcare is free text form. And one of the ways is how can we improve our use of that information? Um, most of what we do in healthcare is the related database, which is your electronic medical record. And so um, these days we have the information, we have the textual mining, the natural language processing. How can we incorporate more of that unstructured data to give better information to the healthcare uh, providers? So this registry is a uh, lipoprotein uh, registry. Uh, so it is uh, a genetic protein. Um, I don't handle the genetics portion of it, but uh, there's a test that we're able to run in the clinical setting uh, by all sorts of different healthcare providers, cardiology, internists, et cetera. Um, and then from there, we're trying to use it to understand atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease. So. Uh, unfortunately, everything that you're eating right now is probably uh, leading to your plaque of your arteries um, getting tighter. Um, so exercise, get your 150 plus steps uh, in this week or uh, 30 uh, plus minutes a day of exercise. Um, but essentially, uh, the atherosclerosis is the closing of your arteries due to plaque uh, buildup in your arteries. Um, and so lifestyle, environment, diet, exercise, uh, obviously partial genetics, um, is all the type of things that we're trying to understand how they work together uh, to help uh, with your heart. Uh, so this registry is actually a 30,000 uh, patient registry. And as always, we're like, oh my goodness, this is 30,000 patients. It's the largest database of its kind uh, using LPA protein. And then we start analyzing the essays. So essays are different types of tests that have been used over the last two decades 
to analyze uh, this research. And what we ended up finding out that one of the essays wasn't really as reliable as we hoped. So our 30,000 isn't 30,000 anymore. Uh, it's actually closer to 16,000, but still really large in terms of the biostatistics space. So we're not going to credit butters, the ICD codes, 9 and 10 now. Uh, our uh, procedural codes that are from when you're uh, getting billing from a hospital procedure, uh, whether it's elective or not. Uh, the natural language processing that I just described here, but also the laboratory values as well. Um, and this is where it can be tricky because with laboratory values, not everybody is going to get those values unless you're in a clinical trial. So if you're uh, in a clinical trial looking at heart failure, the normal patients are going to get lab values like creatinine or troponin. Uh, but if you're normally healthy, the health insurance company is not going to pay for those random tests. You have to have a viable medical condition to get those out of outside of a clinical trial. So guess what? When you're doing a retrospective study and you want to look at both clinical patients and uh, that are normal or that have uh, these symptoms, you're out of luck in terms of sometimes uh, being able to analyze these values because only the patients that are sick retrospectively are going to have access uh, to those values. Um, so that's uh, in terms of the studies here, and as always. Uh, in data science, we always want all of our research to be important, but we don't know that it's important to others think that it's important. And so, uh, obviously, for anyone that does academic research, you know this, how many times it's cited in Google Scholar or uh, you know research gate and things of that nature. Um, but when you're actually in another presentation, someone is actually showing the slide of your own work um, is uh, the best uh, thing ever. Um, this actually ended up. Um, was very important. This was a pilot study of uh, looking at a new procedure in electrophysiology uh, to better correct for um, uh, pacing of the heart. And so his thing is uh, the new method that we're trying to create, the BIV pacing, is the uh, standard procedure. And this led to a whole new panel at the AEHA Chicago conference in 2022 being all just on the same bottle pacing. And so um, after this pilot study, which is actually the precursor to a uh, clinical trial that's going to be starting up in the next uh, year or so, um, we'll be helping to uh, set the trend in terms of understanding when we can use this procedure and, and who we should be using uh, this procedure on. Um, and so being uh, very beneficial and trend setting um, in, in that factor. So enough of my research, where can we go from here in the healthcare research? Um, so the two main areas that I've been focusing on here is big data, precision medicine, how can we make those real world decisions, um, but also the algorithms and applications. So in this case, on the big data side, knowing that we can use various data points, like the crime study that I showed you, we used American Community Census Survey data. We used the Chicago data portal for crime data. We used our own electronic medical record. Um, we've used Abbott Laboratories uh, to gather data in the operating room setting so that we're able to have the uh, readings uh, in real time as well as the ICD codes and the procedural codes and demographic information and things of that nature. So uh, there's a whole lot of different you know, sources that we can use. A uh, thing that's been very trending, and I should note, in the last couple of years, we actually have our own data science genetics uh, uh, panel discussion forum group in the AHA and other areas of cardiovascular medicine. Uh, ironically enough, I remember when I was doing my accountancy degree um, uh, back in 2010, I told them that I was going to go after my accountancy master's and go for statistics um, and eventually my data science degree. And I remember one of my accounting profs going, why are you doing that? It's going to be here today, gone tomorrow. It's a trend that's not going to stick around. Right? And they're like, what are you going to use data analytics for in accounting anyway? Fast forward 20 years, the CPA as of this year, uh, actually as of uh, last year, just put it on. In addition to research, they have to have a data analytics section of the CPA in order to get certified. Um, so it's amazing how you know they think it's a trend and um, of course, you fall off your seat when the hardest teacher in town emails you at work and says, can, we're coming up with a data program for the Masters of Science and Accountancy. Can you help us formulate a course plan for what classes should be offered with accountancy for data analytics? Uh, and you're like, 
You know you were the hardest teacher on me, and you only know me because of my dog. But um, in those cases, uh, it's really trending, second mover in a lot of different fields, but as we know, data science um, is really important. Um, streaming healthware data, so those Fitbits um, can be accurate and reliable to a certain extent. Um, and so in incorporating all of those types of things together. Social media, so not only like how people believe in healthcare and what they understand of healthcare, but also using it as a tool back to the patient as to how we can give them proper information on social media, uh, support groups, uh, in other ways, you know, when you have a chronic condition, you're going to be with it for life. How can you get through, you know, the emotional, the psychological, uh, as well as the physical uh, situation with that? Uh, and then we know with COVID-19, uh, chatbots and telehealth medicine were really important for socialization, as well as for providing answers and things like IBM Watson to get information uh, that we needed in a healthcare setting. Um, for all of those that are in graphic, uh, gaming, uh, robotics, engineering, uh, which is great, uh, University Carlisle School of Medicine has just connected with the um, School of Engineering and also the Business School to understand how to incorporate all those different things together. Um, and so robotics is becoming really key for a lot of different uh, surgical processes, but also how to handle other uh, specimens and other things outside of uh, support staff of the operating uh, room as well. 3D printing. So one of the grand rounds we had a few years ago, uh, University of Washington uh, used 3D printing to you get a cardiovascular image, and you take that and you create it into a 3D printing of that person's individual heart and then take an intervention catheter uh, that you would use during the procedure and know before the procedure if that size catheter is actually going to work or not in the heart instead of wasting 10 to 20 minutes trying to figure out which catheter size is going to work or not. So a lot of things that we can use as pre-planning uh, for surgery and having a more exact plan going in uh, for those procedures than necessarily that. Uh, as well as using 3D printing for study purposes for medical students as well. Uh, getting sort of more of an exact shape of what the heart uh, looks like and not just a drawing. And that leads me to the last thing on here, which is the virtual reality. So for any of you that are gamers that like to create uh, virtual reality spaces, they're actually using it for autopsies now. So instead of using human cadavers, actually creating a virtual reality of what the 3D human body looks like. And now you can know exactly how far away the kidney is from you know, the intestines or you know, different things like that um, as well. Uh, the virtual reality is also used for practice and surgeries, both for physicians that are attending and student fellows and medical students, um, as to how do we learn this new procedure, uh, particularly when you're doing things robotic with robotic arms, um, how can you perfect that um, as well. Um, as you see from the other slide here, uh, you know, uh, computer vision, basic science, genetics, we've been using a lot of these methods for a while, but being able to expand them into all areas of cardiovascular medicine as well as the entire general health sphere um, as well. And then you can see the challenges, you know, ethically, you know, can we use this model or not? Legally, who owns this model and copyrights and, and so forth, the legalities of that? How do we clinically and what uh, circumstances use this model? And then obviously privacy and cybersecurity concerns um, as well. Um, I forgot to mention as well that social network analysis along with geospatial analysis is very helpful across genetics and a wide variety of contact tracing, right? We all did this during COVID-19. Um, all of that spans from social network analysis as well. And then finally, to the students in the room, um, what part of data science uh, skill sets are we looking for here? So the first thing that I always say, you need your yin and yang. You need to have some understanding of data statistics, but you also need to have some understanding of machine learning, deep learning networks for sure. Um, networks are the main thing in most of the most advanced research questions right now. You need to have a lot of different programs in your toolbox. So I know students that say, I just want to know Python, I just want to know R. And you really need to know both of them. And sometimes the old school programs are easy, maybe not so nicely in all the visualizations, but some of the more biological uh, uh, algorithms in Stata and SAS uh, are still the best in some of those as well. And you need to know how to pull your own data. If you're working with a team, you might have a data manager that's going to be doing all the data pulling for you. If you're a one-woman show or one-woman person, like I was at uh, University of Chicago, 
I was pulling my data and analyzing it and doing the whole data pipeline as well. So being having at least some understanding of the pipeline or being able to do certain parts of it yourself as well is very helpful as well. Um, we are mostly a relational database, so understanding SQL, but if we're using unstructured data, if we're going to be dealing with social media and web scraping and all that, understanding Hadoop and all the families of non-SQL relational databasing as well uh, is also very important. Top three skills that you need to know when you're in the field is not only technical skills, top three soft skills. I am the one of uh, pro uh, professors that says no final exams, you're doing a final project your whole way through, you have to present it in PowerPoint and you have to write a final project paper. Uh, you need to know how to write to the client with by various audiences, technical, lay people that are non-technical audiences. Um, you need to be able to tell a data story message. So when I teach data viz, um, what's the specific story that your result is trying to show in that data visualization? And how can you weave that through your literature review, through your discussion section? Just like you write a story in English, you're writing a story with data, um, and you're presenting it with visualizations and writing the story uh, through your paper. Uh, and then finally, problem solving critical thinking skills for the ultimate knowledge that you can use in real world decisions. So thank you so much for listening today, and uh, these are my references, all sorts of them. Um, thank you so much again for listening today, and I'll open it up to Q&A in the room and online chat. Yes? Yes, so you mentioned one of your examples was the pre-COVID one, you didn't have enough sample data. Yes. And then you got, to, now you work in now that there's tons of data. Right. What are the barriers for, for smaller institutions mm -hmm. to, to collaborate with other institutions to, to grow the sample size? Is that not happening, or, if, or, or how does it happen, and if not, what are the barriers? So, uh, that's a very good question. One of the major barriers in a single center network is you only see 50 patients a year on a given uh, disease. So the only way to increase that is obviously to market more that we can solve these types of problems. Uh, and have referrals from internists uh, coming to that hospital. Or if you're doing prospective research, then you can say, hey, I have buddies you know, in Arizona and, and you know, obviously Brigham and different hospitals with larger networks. Can we collaborate in a larger prospective trial to get the sample size that we need for that uh, prospective real-time clinical trial? Unfortunately, um, in a single center, if you're doing something uh, over time, it's just all those patients that you have in that hospital setting in time. So unless the company can start you know, buying hospitals and building up your network, uh, there's only so much you can do in terms of increasing that sample size uh, at the home base. So on that, the, I know that a lot of hospitals are using like Epic, the same, yes. but it's, it's not universally structured data. They, can't collaborate and just get get their data sets? The brunt of all existence. So um, I know a hospital not in uh, the state of Illinois that they're waiting two years to go on Epic uh, because the legality, the privacy data management, security, all is pre-set up to actually getting it, the transition rollover from whatever program they were using before to you know implicating Epic. Um, yeah, there are all sorts of different commercial products out there, some better than others. Uh, and then incorporating it for your own specific purposes. So, you know, you have the basic package and then what do you need for that specific model, a hospital model setup and things of that nature. Um, there are in the state of Illinois and other states uh, a community uh, database where if the patient gives consent uh, and there's different networks in town, Right? You go for a second referral or your internist is in network one and the hospital you need is in network two. Um, if you consent as a patient, uh, they will connect all that data into the commercial, uh, me, into the community uh, network database. Um, but otherwise, um, if you go from network one to network two, you have to bring in paper form or have an electronic sign off to send your records from network one to network two so they have a complete uh, history of your medical health. And always have copies. Paper is just as good as electronic, right? Back up to the backup. So, yeah. Any other questions? 
Well, you mentioned the uh, sort of low level of uh, in the public for AI. Mm -hmm. What's the perception among doctors and medical professionals towards that? Uh, very good question. Um, I think the people who are, and doctors are really good about wanting to try new things, right? So trying to understand. I, you know, there's obviously some that may be old school, this is how I've been doing it my whole life, I want to stay the same. Um, but a lot of the younger individuals, um, you know, we have to get continued education every year, physicians most definitely in other healthcare. So they are seeing these panels come out that, you know, we can do all this advanced, answer advanced questions using, you know, geospatial analysis and, and other types of programs and things of that nature. So I think the younger generation um, is getting more into them, and even I'd say people in the in the middle age as well um, are. We can work in groups. I don't know how to do it, but I know I can find someone on campus, or maybe we need to hire in. Um, and actually, what came about at the University of Chicago, as happens with many hospitals, um, is they have a statistical lab. And everyone comes through that statistical lab, whether they're in cardiology, oncology, hematology, whatever allergy that you're at the hospital, you have to come in and it's like legal aid. You get whoever's first come, first serve to help you analyze that data. And when, um, when you come in, you're gonna plan, you're gonna meet with someone, and then you're gonna come back and you're gonna meet with that person. Uh, you're gonna possibly meet with a new person and have to explain all over again. And they might not all know the, the cardiovascular terminology as well. So they go, we need someone in-house. We have this humongous uh, cardiology department for a single center. Um, I was in charge of five subsections. I was the still uh, statistician for uh, University of Chicago uh, cardiology department. And so being able to be there and say, I you know, can come in learning the terminology. We have this one sole person that understands how these different divisions work together. Um, and you know, this is how, uh, after my five years, it came out like with 122 abstracts and papers um, in that five years working with those five different subsections, right? Um, and shortly um, after I left, uh, they are starting to create a universal database uh, where we, you know, starting a better pipeline stream of data so you can incorporate uh, a lot faster all those different data points for those different divisions. Question over here? Yeah. You mentioned that 80% of health data is text data. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that with text data, you can't perform a lot of statistics on that. So what are some of the ways you need to transform that text data to be able to perform those statistical analysis? Yeah, so uh, the question was, you know, uh, you have unfree text data. What is the way that you can um, use uh, what methods can you use to analyze free text data? Because there's not a lot of things you can statistically, uh, numerically analyze with it. Uh, so as I mentioned with the uh, database that I showed you with the LK registry, um, trying to use it to numerically count, uh, you know, search for certain words or uh, understanding of related words that would say this person has uh, this condition or not. Um, so it can be used to locate the sample group that we're looking for, uh, that we're going to sample from or you know, analyze retrospectively. Um, it can also be used, as we did here, with risk factors and uh, outcomes to determine what those are. Um, as you probably saw from the front, I did a word cloud of what the heart physically looks like, not the Valentine's Day heart that we normally see. Um, and saying, you know, in a journal, what are the hottest words that are being used in the journal articles right now? What are the main topics that they're relating to? And so creating word clouds. Um, we can also do a lot of social network analysis. So something I didn't bring up is digital humanities. Um, and so being able to do those textual mining and natural language processing uh, with those areas uh, with biomedical e-text research um, as well. So uh, we can convert some of this into numbers and use it as counts uh, as, and, and incorporate it into some statistical analysis, um, but mostly it's used to create variables that we can then um, analyze, typically as categorical data, but analyze um, in a statistical nature like a test or uh, a regression or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim and I work in a mining house. Yes. It's typically ranked one of the last industries to adopt technology. Mm -hmm. I think I have heard you say ag, uh, agricultural mining, right? Uh, uh, construction. Construction. Mm -hmm. uh, 
how can our industry get better at adopting new technologies? If I had that question, I'd be a millionaire um, or more. Uh, no, I think in, in this case, it's just like in the healthcare sphere, it's understanding um, what knowledge people have. So the you know the Pew Research Center here is saying that there's not public awareness of it. So bringing more knowledge. Uh, so probably first of all education. Um, you know having speakers come in and, and talk about you know we've used it in this related field. You know so construction is very close to real estate, right? Real estate and finance use this all the time and have started to more um, in the last decade or so. So you know finding ways that you know we can help you buy your house better using Zillow algorithms, right? Um, that's related to construction, supply and demand, uh, you know, what materials are available for that house, you know, is that house going to move and put a 30% profit or not, right? Um, so finding, you know, ways in a related field that you can get speakers to say, hey, this can help with your profit, right, and your overhead, um, you know, if you get more efficient, uh, you can cut your overhead by 15%, increase your revenue by 30, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and you know, money talks in, in the field. So if you can find ways that it can help your overall outcome, whatever that outcome might be, um, you know, your pool of whatever it is that you're mining, you know, you can increase uh, that and reduce, um, uh, you know, scrap or resource, um, you know, reutilize, um, you know, scrap and things of that nature, and say, hey, you know, we can't use this as the main product, but we can take that and then create it into something new or get, you know, a uh, stipend from the city for, you know, recycling it correctly, you know, all those types of things. And we can use that through data technology, you know, that can also head up a, a lot of ways there as well. Thank you. You're very welcome. Any other questions? Okay, let's give one more round of applause. Still a little bit of food left if you want to grab something on your way out. We'll be back the first Friday of April. So thanks everybody. Have a great weekend.